Okay. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, we have a lot more people registered than this, and I think they're just betting that they can come golf later, hopefully. <laughs> so we'll still get to meet them, but uh, we do have some guys in the webinar too, uh, and we are recording this, so um, you know, don't yell out obscenities. I'll try to keep obscenities out of my uh, presentation, which is kind of hard for me to do, actually. Um, but anyways, if I haven't met you and introduced myself already, which I think I have to everyone here, uh, I'm John Spade. I'm the CTO at Anchor Point. Um, Anchor Point is a security-focused managed security services provider. Uh, we only care about IT security. That's all we want to do. Um, my background is I spent uh, about seven years on the Oklahoma City Police Department. I did IT. If you guys live in the Oklahoma City area and you've seen the new black cars driving around, all the IT in there was something I put together. Um, Security is kind of built into my background due to that upbringing, kind of in my early career. Uh, and then after the police department, I worked at a you know, Fortune 500 insurance company that had uh, global offices all over the place, over 300 individual locations, uh, where I deployed WIPS technology, uh, deployed an entirely new DNS and DHCP and IP address management system there as part of a, another security project. and. Uh, Lee and I and uh, all of the analysts and engineers that we have at Anchor Point have a background uh, across healthcare, finance, uh, all kinds of sectors, military, law enforcement, like I already said. And uh, we are focused primarily on providing services. Uh, a lot of companies and people call us a VAR. Uh, we like to say that we're, we're a VAR second. We're a service company first. And all we want to focus on as our primary mission is to provide the people and the process to secure IT for our customers. Um, a lot of our processes and the way we build things, the way we do things with the SIM is based around the NIST cybersecurity framework. We are huge proponents of standards-based security because there's a lot of value there. Now, the problem with that is that there's also a whole bunch of reading to do, and you know these are not small documents that NIST puts out. I think they pay those guys by the page, and it must be you know they make their money because a couple of those things are you know easily in the 400 page range, and you've got to go through all that kind of stuff and write this kind of thing down. What we're doing right now uh, with a lot of our customers is offering a NIST cybersecurity framework evaluation. We will send uh, an analyst or myself out to go gather some information, look at current procedures, protocols you have in place, what technologies are helping support your security controls, and evaluating those against the cybersecurity framework and delivering a full report. Uh, kind of looks like having a HIPAA audit or a PCI audit same type of document coming back, except this is about real security. It's not just about compliance. You can take this evaluation and turn it into a audit for any of the, those other standards. If you have FISMA requirements, if you have SOX requirements around your IT controls, PCI, HIPAA, like I already said, the cybersecurity framework maps to all those. And it doesn't just map to a minimum that you have to hit. It maps to actually being secure. And that's what we aim to actually provide is real security and not just compliance-based, check the box. We encrypted that, so let's move on. It doesn't, it's not easy to implement a security program in a lot of companies these days. It's difficult to get budget, it's difficult to find personnel, and a lot of places, are, again, are driven by compliance and what they end up doing is buying a lot of fancy tools that are supposed to meet compliance needs and no one knows how to use them properly, they get deployed improperly, and sometimes they sit there neglected. And security is often seen as the department of no. Uh, we just get to tell people, you can't do that. And then we have all these fancy tools that we barely use and really don't show any return on investment on. Anchor Point is the answer to that. Uh, for the small and medium-sized businesses, we aim to be the security team. Uh, places where they don't have a CSO or a CISO, 
They only have a few IT guys running around trying to keep their day-to-day -day operations up. Uh, those are the people that we can supplement and augment those security teams. And we can provide our SIM. We can bring in our technology partners, uh, which we have many. And two of our best ones are Cisco and Radware, and they're here today to talk to you guys more about some of their solutions. Both of those um, companies, we have our engineers and analysts trained in their technologies, ready to help support our customers uh, deploying that and maintaining it. One thing that you will always hear from Lee and myself when we're talking about deploying a technology and taking care of a customer, and before we ever get anywhere close to a sale, uh, everybody wants to focus on what am I buying? You know, what what's the price on this? I want to buy this technology, this hardware, this licensing, and we like to step back and say we don't want to just sell you licensing and hardware, uh, which I know sounds like a weird salesy thing to say, um, but what we really mean is we don't want to sell you this stuff and have it stagnate. Have you not feel you got value out of this? So. Like I said, we're a VAR second, we keep our prices low so that we can also sell services and training. So that the people internally that you want to actually use the product, receive training, uh, if, it's, uh, if it fits in the cycle well, we even send our own analysts and engineers along with your personnel to the training and we will then build the managed service up for you um, and run that uh, if that's desired as well. That's the primary goal. Uh, we have other technology partners and other service partners too outside the world of security. Um, and a couple of you guys are here, I think. And it's, it's really valuable to have those partners because we don't want to expand into doing IT service management or doing a whole bunch of hardware reselling. Uh, that's something we do because it's there and people need it. Um, but I never like to sell hardware and licensing without training or services attached to it because I don't want to see it go unused. Uh, one of the largest projects I ever worked on is still going on. It's been 16 years, several million dollars, and it shows no signs of ever ending. It's not something Anchor Point's involved in, by the way. This was a long time ago, somewhere else. And uh, that's the kind of thing that destroys careers, multiple careers. It doesn't show any value. It gets a lot of uh, regulatory authorities involved, state auditors, things like that, people you don't want coming around. And our goal is to not have that happen with this type of thing. Um, we want top-notch security programs for our customers. So with letting you guys know that, Lee and I will be around uh, all evening and uh, manning the chat rooms in the webinar. If you have any questions, uh, if you brought a laptop or a phone, you can join the webinar as well if you want to ask questions in there, but you guys are in the room, so feel free to throw something at us or whatnot. But uh, we will have online polls, so hopefully you do have some kind of device with you. Uh, that you can use uh, text or Twitter or a web page, I believe, to go in and respond to the polls. Uh, so you'll see those come up, and uh, we won't spam you. If you text us, it says that and everything. Uh, we don't even get your number. It's not shared with us, so uh, we have whatever you registered with, but if you don't want to get texts, that's okay. And uh, anything else I've missed, Lee? No, actually, we are spamming people. Oh, okay, sorry. There'll be spam. Well, we're spamming your email. <laughs> not your phone. That's different. No, no, no. Use it to respond to the polls. We aren't, we aren't using that. So we probably will spam you if you sign up for marketing emails, but... Um, it's good spam. So, anyways, uh, with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Prakash from Radware, and I will now commence the ceremony of the switching of the mics. <laughs> so, give me a minute on that. And the cable. Yeah. Okay. That's the wire. You, this is the wireless for the camera, and the mute button's here, so you can switch that back on when you're ready. And this is the webinar. Okay. Yes. Holy. I recommend looping this under your belt in the back so that it okay. doesn't yank off. 
Looping, how do you do that? Open the belt. Just stuff in your pocket. Oh, stuff in, stuff in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Just stuff it in your pocket. Okay, that way. And then tuck this under your belt like that. Oh, got yeah. it. Techniques. And then just put that in your other pocket. Okay, and, and switch, switch that on. Uh, no, that's the meat. There you go. That's good. That's it. It's on, right? Okay. Does it give a certain time you want to go? Or no. All right. Good to go. Just, uh, so this is front and back? Yeah. Yeah, it's worn off. So. Yeah, just give my question. All right. Thank you, John. So, very quick background for me. Uh, I started my career with uh, as a developer for Tandem Computers, worked as a developer for almost 10 years, and then I moved to the dark side, which is product management. Uh, ran product management for Juniper, for Cisco, um, Informatica, uh, and then five years at Citrix for their networking products. So I ran you know, security product lines for Cisco uh, and Juniper, as well as uh, networking product line, which is the application delivery controllers for um, for Citrix. I've been at Radware for past three and a half years, running application delivery for North America. And today, um, I'm going to focus on just you know quick introduction to Radware, and then what we do and uh, how do we guarantee application um, service level agreements. And then we've done a lot of work with Cisco, integrating our products into Cisco product lines. And one of our products is also OEM'd by Cisco in their firepower. So we'll talk about that, uh, what we do in terms of application delivery as well as security. So hopefully this will be of interest. And then definitely ask me questions. Um, so very quickly about Radware, it's a public company um, our world headquarters is in Tel Aviv, Israel, and U.S. headquarters is in Mawa, New Jersey. Uh, we've been public since 1997, traded on NASDAQ. We have uh, upwards of 1,000 employees, more than 10,000 customers, some very large ones that you see. Um, so some of our bigger ones are Bloomberg Depository Trust Corporation, which clears all of the stocks for, New uh, for U.S. Um, eBay, the eBay market site is protected by Radware Gear, uh, both web application firewall as well as Defense Pro product line, as well as they use Alteons for securing some of their certs as well, decrypting communication and looking into um, and preventing attacks that are encrypted attacks. So we'll, we'll take a look at some of that. Lots of partners, and Cisco is one of our bigger ones. Um, so we have in lots of... Uh, work that we do with Cisco. In terms of solutions, there are two areas of focus for Radware. So one is security, um, which is our Defense Pro, denial of service prevention, web application firewall, both delivered in the cloud as well as on-prem. And there is a hybrid approach to that as well. And then the second part is our application delivery. So this is where we provide availability services to all of the applications that you may have in the data center or in the cloud. So those are the two areas of focus for Radware. And if you notice here, there's some very, very large customers that use our products um, um, to secure their infrastructure and to make it highly available. So those are two areas of focus for us. We are one of the Gartner Magic Quadrant leaders as well uh, in the application delivery, and there is no um, magic quadrant for the denial of service yet, right? But we are de facto leaders in that space. Our mission is to, you know, ensure that there is, you know, there is optimal service level for any applications that you may have in your data center, right? So that's that's what we strive to deliver. Okay, and why should you care about that, right? So. You know, in your own data centers, in your own applications, the cost of outage is very high, right? So if you look at this, this is, uh, you know, one of the reports from 2014, half a million dollars per hour, right, for an outage. And the outage can be caused because of either equipment failure, so how do you make it fault tolerant or highly available? 
And the second part is because of some kind of attack on it. Right? So how do you prevent that? So those are the areas that we focus on with our application delivery as well as with security. And the impact is to the bottom line. Right? So either revenue, if you have, or an e-commerce site, if you're selling something and somebody takes out on your site, you lose money. It could be productivity. There are lots of different things that get impacted if your sites or applications go down, right? So that's, that's our focus. That's what we prevent. And today we are focusing on mainly security aspects of it. And if you look at the impact of denial, so if you look at the attacks that pl take place in the infrastructure, most of the attacks used to be on the in, be used to on, on the firewall load balancers, no longer so, right? If you notice, servers are getting attacked more and more. Um, the backend database is not yet so, but the SQL injection and those type of attacks target this. But if you look at the internet pipe, you can saturate the internet pipe. So those are aspects. It's, it's, so we are looking at this holistically and addressing each one of those points of how we can prevent outages at those points, right? So denial of service is one type of attack that can take place in this infrastructure. So in this, in this context, what we are trying to do with our availability services is to optimize normal operation. As you're running your applications and you're delivering these applications, could be a banking service, for example, right? And you, an online banking application. And you are going to a website and accessing your accounts um, those are being accessed using APIs. If they're not secure, anybody can access that. So there is lots of impact to that API access. Can somebody access it and send malicious requests to it? Do you check who the user is, authentication aspects of it, right? And you know, if, if, uh, are they sending information to it that's secured? So unless you decrypt it, you won't know what's being sent. Right? So SQL injection is a very good example of that kind of attack where you can actually send information to a backend um, database and extract information. So those are kind of things that you need to prevent. Web application firewall is a technology that we provide to prevent those kind of attacks. Right. So one is optimize. When everything is running great, how do you ensure that the latency is least? That's the aspect that we cover. Second is, if something does happen, how do you minimize the application or the uh, infrastructure to, from degrading, right? So that's the second aspect that we address. And the third is how do you prevent outage, right? So those are the three key things that we at Radware address. And we'll go and take a look at how do we, how do, we uh, do this. There is a very quick uh, survey. Uh, if you want to dial into uh, Twitter, or Twitter or to um, to your messaging system and uh, type in 22333 uh, with a message of anchor point and it'll give you uh, a way to answer respond to these questions so if you would like to respond I'll give you a couple of couple of minutes if you want to take a, a stab at that that was pretty good so type yeah so dial or send a message to 22333 with the message of anchor point, and then it'll give you, and then type in A, B, or C. I got one more. couple more responses. Did it work? It did, okay, all right. So let's move on from, okay. Give you one more, one more minute. All right, moving on. Oh, there's there are more so you don't have to re resend the message just just type in a b or c and it it should be fine
Okay, moving on to the next one. All right, so no more service. <laughs> so how do we guarantee this? You know, so the, the three things that we talked about was optimized normal operation. The second was preventing outage uh, or, you know, preventing degradation or minimizing degradation. And third is preventing outage, right? So we'll take a look at each one of those. So first is if you look at applications, so let's say it's a banking service, an application that's running in your data center or if it's running in your cloud. So if you already moved to cloud, how do, how, do you, uh, how do you optimize these normal operations? So first is if there are lots of requests coming to it, how do you scale it? Okay, so scalability is one of, one of the aspects of, um, you know, if there are lots of requests, how do you prevent degradation and optimize that operation, right? So we have a concept of a fabric in, in, in um, so you can add in new instances on the fly to existing running, uh, you know, application delivery controllers. And typically these controllers deploy in front of applications. So for example, let's say you, you have uh, accounts at Citibank. Citibank has its own data center. You are accessing an online banking from Citibank, right? So when, when the requests actually are going to these applications that are providing online banking, they are being intercepted by these type of appliances. And then, so they, they, the, these appliances terminate that connection that comes in, and then it pulls connections to the back end. So millions of users can come in while there are only few connections to the back end and systems that gets rotated, right? So basically you scale that by providing this bridge between the users and the backend systems, right? So we scale that by adding, if there are lots of users, we can scale that by adding new instances it's called scale in or scale out, right? So we can increase the capacity to handle the number of users that, that are coming in. And we isolate these also the new concept is of sharing this infrastructure across multiple users, right? So we provide multi-tenancy, right? So multi-tenancy is one of the aspects where you can take an infrastructure and carve that out for multiple different departments or users without one impacting another, isolation, right? So those are the kind of concepts and architectures that are built into the product to provide that kind of scale. Second is in optimizing normal operation. I go to a website and I don't get a quick response. I would usually not go back to that website if it's the, you know, the response time is very slow, right? So we have products that accelerate this um, website without really you having to modify the applications. Just like a web application firewall prevents you know, attacks from taking place on a database or on an application, in the same concept, without changing the application code itself, you can apply these techniques to accelerate um, applications. We've seen up to 40% improvements in websites just by enabling or checkboxing these kind of uh, functions. Right? So that's, that's a normal operation. If it's an outage, there are lots of different endpoints, uh, access points where attacks can take place. And this is, um, so if, if you look at the type of attacks that take place, uh, you know, volumetric attacks to fill the pipe, for example, for the backend application, you know, it's cross-site request forgery or cross-site scripting. There's a brute force attack trying to get access to these applications, trying to find out, you know, different points where you can get access to it. All of this used to be very difficult. You had to know the, in, you know, the infrastructure, the application, how they're coded, et cetera. There are many, many tools that make it so simple to do, right? So these things, each one of these points are where, which can be attacked, right? Any questions? So what we do is we provide protection for these points, right, with our product set. So it could be uh, denial of service protection at these points, it could be web application firewall to prevent access to applications and databases to prevent a cross-site request forgery or LDAP injection type of attacks or SQL injection type of attacks. It could be an IPS to prevent an SSL flood. It could be you know, SQL injection protection using uh, web application firewall. Or in the new one is SSL protection. So SSL protection, not just for 
data or access that's being um, you know, uh, coming from the users from the outside. It's also internal users. Let's say you have an infected laptop, OK? So by social engineering, somebody comes in, an employee, somebody drops a, a USB stick, for example, which is infected. It's very uh, you know, easy for somebody to just pick up and see what's on that USB. They come in and hook it on the laptop. Boom, you, you are infected, right? So those kind of infections, now those are you know, command and control bots. Okay, so for example, they can connect to an external site, encrypt that communication using the external user's public key. And if you don't have the private key for that, you cannot decrypt that communication, right? So we provide, and it's, it's called SSL proxy or forward SSL proxy, okay? Those are the type of attacks which, is, which we prevent, right, it's by doing SSL inspection. So those are newer type of attacks, and they take you know, critical information from the enterprise and send it outside without you really knowing about it, right? So it's, it's, it's called SSL inspection or SSL type of protection, and it's a forward SSL proxy type of use case. But there's a lot of complexity, but the tools have become very, very simple to create, the, uh, to attack these points, right? So these are the attacks that we protect and, and prevent you, you know, outages. And if you look at, okay, I can, and so how do we do that? We do that in the cloud or on-premise. So we have solutions that are either, uh, can be deployed just purely in the cloud, which is a defense pipe, or you have on-premise deployment of both of our load balancers that can be deployed in the cloud as a virtual machine, um, which we, you'll, you'll see in just a second how we integrate with Cisco. But also our denial of service prevention uh, solutions that can you know, go on, you know, deploy on-prem and prevent these type of attacks, right? So we have solutions that are, you can mix and match these solutions to fit in um, the size of your infrastructure and the kind of uh, uh, investment that you want to make on it, right? So it, it, it can go all the way from very sc small scale to very large scale as well. Now, in, in order to prevent degradation, right? So degraded, you know, degrade of an infrastructure happens when you don't have enough resources to address what's going on, right? So in that case, what we provide is a distributed architecture and also a unique signaling concept or messaging concept that we have built. And this is in Cisco's Firepower as well. And I'll, I'll show that to you in just a second. Um, that we have built in so that if an attack, for example, a cloaked type of attack is happening, and then somebody's taking resources away from your application delivery controllers, we have mechanisms to message outside and take that malicious attack, scrub it in, a, in the cloud and then bring the clean data back into the enterprise, right? So that way, your, your internet infrastructure pipe is not filled, right? So that's something that our distributed architecture actually gives us. The other aspect is to know exactly what's going on, right? So that requires visibility. So we've built in tools that allow us not just visibility at the data tier, but also network as well as the client tier. Right? So we have application performance monitoring as well as multi-device management dashboards that allow us to look into all of this data right, from different points. And based on that, you can make a, a, a good judgment of what's going on in the enterprise. You have um, uh, uh, security dashboards that you can look at. If something is going on in the enterprise, it actually um, you know, shows up in the security dashboard. So it's very clear of what's going on in the enterprise. Uh, we have portals that you can look at um, for different tenants as well. And so all of that uh, information uh, prevents or minimizes degradation, right? So those are three key aspects uh, that we talked about. Now I'm gonna talk about how we integrate with Cisco. Okay, so all of that infrastructure, so our core focus in Radware is to focus on security and application delivery. And we are addressing the key points where outages happen or security attacks take place. Those are the key components that we are trying to address. 
with Cisco, we have a very good partner partnership with Cisco. So there are three key um, areas that we addressed with Cisco. One is in terms of policy controller. Cisco has moved very, you know, in a big way in SDN, right? So application, you know, uh, our software-defined uh, networks, networking, um, you know, our software-defined data centers. So that's one aspect that we have integrated our products with, and we'll take a look at that. The other is with the Cisco's unified computing system. So this is the server arch infrastructure that was built by Cisco, hugely successful, right? So that's something that it's an off-the-shelf server that our infrastructure or applications can run on. And the last piece is if you're looking at new switches or uh, the firepower, uh, our products are integrated into that infrastructure, right? So if you want to prevent a denial of service, uh, Cisco provides firepower, firewall, the next generation firewall, with a built-in denial of service protection. Right, so that's that's the third key piece that we've integrated. Let's take a very quick look at what we've done at each one of these uh, uh, integration touch points. So for, first is the Epic or application programmatic infrastructure. Uh, Gerald, do you remember what application control infrastructure? Okay, it's a policy engine that connects multiple different products in a network together from a control plane perspective. And then you can logically define a policy across all of this infrastructure and then deploy those policies as a physical policy on these devices. Okay, so let's take a look at what happened. So what, what are we offering here? Both our, uh, both our application delivery and the security product lines are integrated in Epic or in the ACI. We have device packages that are available out of the box. And so you can pick and choose in this policy controller. So this is what it gives you a, uh, uh, like a Visio diagram. If you've played with Visio, it gives you a Visio diagram and you click on each one of these uh, policies and then you can create a logical policy for that infrastructure. So layer four through seven policy would be a hypervisor or, or an ADC, for example, application delivery controller. Or you can create a DDoS protection policy, right? And these policies are logically defined in Epic, the, the, uh, the service graph, as, as they're called. And then you can deploy that, that on the infrastructure. So the infrastructure, in, in, in this context, both the policy and the infrastructure, both are multi-tenant. OK, so you are defining a policy and uh, in a logical way. And ACI defines those touch points. And Radware has integrated our products into that policy controller. OK, so this is if you're looking at SDN and next generation of switches and routers. OK, so here uh, our APIs are used to integrate with the Epic controller. And we, we've already provided this out of the box. OK, and of course, as I mentioned, it was multi-tenant. So you can have different views into this policy depending on this infrastructure. That infrastructure is shared across multiple departments, for example. Each department may have a different need. So you can create, use this infrastructure to provide policies that are per tenant, right, or multi-tenant, right? And you can have different administrators have a different view of this system. Some can modify it. Some can just view it, right? So those are, for, from, uh, for example, from a you know, SOC or a NOC perspective, you want to have different views. So it's a multi-tenant and role-based access control that's also built into this infrastructure. So we, we did that both for our application delivery as well as for denial of service protection, right? So protection policies can be defined per tenant, per application, depending on how you are deploying your infrastructure, right? And so this actually creates a self-defined fabric. So we use our infrastructure along with Cisco's together to create you know, a, a complete security policy across, across this infrastructure. So you can use our web application firewall. You can use our defense pros while still using Cisco's Epic controllers and ACI. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to skip this one. So what, do, what does this look like? So in, in terms of physical deployment, uh, what does this really mean? So for example, you have your backend infrastructure, your web infrastructure, and then you have your internet access, right? So somebody accessing from the internet, and this is your tenants. That is in, let's say, a Cisco chassis that's running, right? Um, so what we've done, and you have this infrastructure that's deployed in the enterprise to secure all of this, right? So what you do in ACI is create a service graph, okay? So this is an administrator for Cisco Epic, creates a service graph, and that service graph has two different kinds of security. One is uh, a north-south security, right? So anybody accessing from outside. So you create those. In this case, in this context, you're creating a denial of service policy, OK? So you're creating that logical policy. And then you're deploying that as a policy on our device, OK? So that's, that's basically you you're using our device, but controlling all these device policies from Epic. Okay, so we provide you device packages pre-built for this. So if you're investing in Cisco infrastructure, Epic for example, we, our products are already integrated with that. Okay, you don't need to make any extra effort to integrate with our devices. Okay. The same thing is true for backend. So this is a east-west communication, for example, inter-tenant attacks, right? So it's an east-west communication. You can create new policies and IPS policy for that, ACLs, for example, right? And you can create a service graph for it, and you can deploy that policy. So it's a reusable policy that can be reused across your infrastructure. And we are using Cisco's policy controller to deploy and manage our devices. Right, so that's the ACI aspect. So in case you haven't heard about ACI, this is the next big thing from Cisco. Okay, so it's a, there's a lot of investment that Cisco is making for the SDN. Okay, so that's what it means. Uh, and this is, this is all integrated. So I'm going to skip that uh, just in the interest of time. The other uh, aspect that we integrate with is the UCS system. Okay, so we've Radware is known, we are one of the Gartner leaders in application delivery controllers. Okay, so what we, and these application delivery controllers are used in front of applications, right? So anybody is accessing these applications, typically the ADC, ADCs act in a reverse proxy or they deploy in front of these applications, right? So all millions of requests come in, get terminated here, and then we scale these. You don't need as many instances of backend applications. We can reuse those requests over a few number of requests on the backend, right? So that way, your investment in the data center remains lower than what it would have been had these communications gone directly to those servers, right? That's where the that's where the payback comes from, you know, investing in ADC, right? So these ADCs actually run virtualized on UCS. Okay, so let's say you have uh, an exchange application that you're running on UCS. Now you can run application delivery controllers on UCS as well. And you can create policies from an ACI fabric. So we do that both for very high-end NFV type of application. These are very large service provider environments. We do that for just a regular virtual appliances, uh, Altian virtual appliances, and we do that for our Defense Pro product lines as well. So all of our product lines can run on UCS, and it's certified on UCS. Okay, so that's the, that's the integration that we have done with UCS. And the last piece that we integrated with is with Firepower. Okay, so the denial of service protection, all the things that we talked about, is also integrated into Firepower. So if you've made investments in Cisco's Firepower, this uh, security, uh, Radware security is already built in, into Firepower, right? Both 4100 and the 90, the next generation firewall. It's already integrates. The denial of service protection, the behavioral 
denial of service protection, as well as the volumetric attack prevention, right? All of that is built into uh, Cisco's firepower. Okay, and that's that's pretty much it. So um, basically what happens is that if, if you have all of these different backend applications and you have uh, the next generation firewall, if we detect that there is any kind of denial of service attack that is taking place, we can message to our infrastructure for scrubbing, or you can use a third party infrastructure for scrubbing if you need to. Uh, in, this, in this case, the defense messaging is specifically for radware, um, defense pipe. If, you, if, you're, if you're investing in the back end, you know, scrubbing deployments from radware. So the integration of this with our scrubbing centers is already built into Firepower as well. Right? And the denial of service protection is also uh, built into Firepower. So you can add on those services directly from uh, Cisco's Firepower as well. Okay, so very quickly, you know, summarizing all the key things that we talked about, uh, you know, integration with Cisco, there are three key different, three key areas that we integrated with. One is the ACI with the policy controller. The second thing that we integrated with was with the server systems. And the third was with the next generation firewalls. All of the Radware products are integrated with Cisco products. And with that, you get the guaranteed application delivery with the Cisco infrastructure. All right, any questions? Uh, I'll be around, so definitely feel free to ask me any questions that you may have or where we are headed next, right, Gerald? Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is the Okay, thank you. Guys, I'm the only thing between you and golf. So you work with me, I work with you, okay? There you go. One more here. Yes. Sure. I know you Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. We already integrated with about eight different See how popular I am, boys. <laughs> I get the I get the uh, I get the send you to the bar stuff. <laughs> oh. oh, we have a fifty-fifty now. Let's see where this ends up. Oh, uh oh. Do I get to vote? All right, and we have a bartender floating through, so um, so I will work through this as quickly as I can. Um, aha, there I sit. So I'm a uh, sorry, I pushed one too many buttons. There we go. So I'm Gerald Parrish with Cisco. Um, I am an AMP specialist, which means. I have a very, very focused uh, set of products that I work on. Um, hence, I could not answer the most simple question Prakash had about Cisco because that's like the big, I, I looked it up though, it's application-centric interface. Um, so uh, my piece of the Cisco pie is what was, is part of an acquisition that was made of SourceFire, if you guys are familiar with that, from the SourceFire days. Um, I'm on a part of a team, Michael Starks is my SC, and Mike Brasilio works with me also. So uh, the reality is that organizations are under attack. Ta-da! Uh, in, case, in case you weren't aware of that. 
But what we're really seeing is that the sophistication is greatly increased. When I got into this business, it was about tagging websites, right? Putting your label over somebody else's website, you know? Um, not that I ever did that. Uh, and now, but then it became an industry. So the age of virus and worms and widely spread things is gone. So if you look at the latest Verizon report on breaches, um, between, so 90% were caused by end users, can't really get rid of them. 75% um, were uh, the result of patches that had been available for over 12 months. So if you tell me your systems are all patched, we can just leave because we're really not being honest with each other. And, uh, and the third component of that, uh, so you have end users, you have unpatched systems, and then you have targeted malware, okay? About 75% of that was targeted malware, never been seen anywhere before, and has never been seen again, okay? So there's very few really, really good malware writers in the world, but there is a lot of copycats, and there is a lot of money being thrown at this. Um, I was on an Onion site last night on Tor, looking into uh, uh, ransomware as a service, RAAS, it's now called, for $484 in American dollars. They guarantee you 300,000 email addresses that they can spam, a 1% hit rate guaranteed or else you get your money back. Um, it has the backend infrastructure, it, they do all the translation for you, uh, foreign languages and currencies. Uh, so for $484, you can buy ransomware as a service. You get two people to click on it, and you've made money because it's somewhere between three and $600 is what we figured out that the world is willing to pay to have their uh, systems decrypted, okay? So it's, it's incredible. Average size of the most, what is the average size of the most targeted organizations? Uh, not my question, so I'm not sure the answer. Uh, but I would say more, more organizations worldwide are this size. So that's probably the answer. All right, uh, give it a second. All right, so malware, again, it's not just a single entity anymore. It, it, most of the attacks that we see are multi-file, multi-vector attacks, all right? Um, you go to this, you visit this website, it looks for a version of Java running in your browser, it downloads a dropper onto your system, the dropper then loads itself into the kernel and now it starts downloading files, okay, from a CNC server. Or it then redirects you to a different website with that, what looks like adware, but it's actually malvertising is what that's called. And so the, yes, um, so the, uh, so what, I, so the, the real picture that you're looking at here is, let's say I walked into your environment tomorrow and, and you gave me access, keys to the kingdom, and I said, okay, I've, I've, I've laid out four files across your across your enterprise can you so it's a trick question you can't um, my laptop MacBook Pro has 249,000 files on that take that multiply it times the number of users you have take that number maybe double it for your servers depending upon if the file servers application servers what have you you have millions and millions if not billions of files within your environment today it only takes me two files to, to get ransomware going on your machines. It only takes me one to get remote access Trojan, so now I can start grabbing passwords. So the, the challenges are both visibility and control. If, if all I give you is visibility, that's great, but I've only increased your workload. So the ability to have control with that visibility is the key. So what are the adversaries doing? Ransomware is the first one. I've already kind of hit on this. You guys know about this. Hospitals have been in the press a lot recently because they have public-facing websites that people visit a lot. If it weren't, uh, and a lot of that was tied into the JBoss uh, situation where there was three million uh, servers worldwide afflicted. Spear phishing. This one, this is cute because this came directly to my LinkedIn. All right? so. Her name is Ashley Wood. She lives in Dallas. I live in Dallas. She went to the University of Dallas. She works for a large company. She's an attractive lady. So instead of just accepting it, like three of my friends had already done, uh, because we had three friends in common, I right-clicked, saved it off, uploaded it to images.google.com. Well, she's actually Deborah Sherman, who got fired in Denver as a news reporter. So this is exactly how people are getting access to your executives. Right? Executive goes and travels, goes to a conference, maybe even speaks at a conference, comes back, gets this. Huh, maybe. I'll click yes. Now they start exchanging emails. Hey, I loved your so-and-so presentation. Can I send you something to look at? 
you know? This is exactly how it happens again and again. Now, and this is a pattern. I don't know how, if any of you have seen this. If any of you guys have seen it, I've seen it three more times since then. Uh, the, the, again, very few good hackers in the world, a lot of people with money, all right? So why is Ashley in all uppercase? Why was the next one the first name in all uppercase and an attractive woman from the University of Dallas? Why was the third one? So th they're just simply being lazy, right? They have stock photos, they upload them, they create a profile, and they start blasting them out, and my friends keep accepting them. All right, so more money, more problems. This is a money game now. The, pr the challenge that we see is the fact that these guys are ending up with hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Or in this case, $60 million. And what that enables you to do is, I don't know if you guys have ever st uh, stood up a, a help desk, not a, cheap, not a cheap thing to do. My ransomware as a service guy the other day, hey, he has his help desk set up, they've got chat, They've got, they've got email addresses, they've got spoofing email addresses, they've got it all. Because once you're successful in this, you have more and more money. What else can you do with money? You can buy security tools to make sure you can bypass them, or you know what they look like at least, right? So this is exactly what's happening. Aha, which type of data has the highest associated breach cost? PHI, cardholder, or PII? Personal health care, personally identifiable, or cardholder data. The highest associated breach cost. Vote. Oh, there we go. It's a three-horse race. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it went with PHI. All right. Very nice. All right. So... What can we learn from Sony? Most security vendors that you talk to are either going to have a Sony slide or a Target slide or a Home Depot slide, right? The three big ones that everybody's familiar with. But this, is, this one's key uh, for what we do and how we do it differently. So Sony Pictures uh, had a breach last year. Uh, the way they got notified, FBI picked up the phone and called them and said, somebody's trying to sell social, uh, Sylvester Stallone's social security number. And it came from you, so you should probably make that stop. So they came out with a press release on day one. Um, we've been breached. We know what's going on. We're, we've got this handled. Three days later, they came out with another one. We've, get, we've been breached. We may know what's going on. We think we've got this handled. And then eight days after that, 11 days after the breach, we've been breached. We have no idea what's going on, but we're bringing in big shots to figure it out. All right? So that's the huge challenge. And think of Sony. I have two boys, 7 and 12. They could fund the IT security group from Sony, right? PlayStation 4 games alone. So it's not as though they don't have money. They have every new and fancy blinky light in the data center. They pay well, so they have really smart folks. But what they have is the exact challenge that, that we have the ability to, to fight against. This is the industry average. Is somewhere between 100 and 200 days, depending upon which statistics you read, um, as to the amount of time that malware sits on networks undetected. Okay? It's out there, there's a file, it's active, it's doing bad things, and you don't know about it. Okay? Because there is no silver bullet. All right? So, as, <laughs> and me standing in front of you, this makes it a lot easier. It's kind of weird on WebEx because I have to go into too much explanation. But, so, I could afford to lose a pound or two, right? And so people say, well, you should exercise more and, and eat less. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I just want a pill and I want it to taste like beer or enchiladas or something that I really like. And they say, no, no, no. So that's exactly what we do in the security industry. We are constantly chasing the, the, the silver bullet. We're constantly chasing the new shiny thing that's going to make all of, you know, that is going to prevent everything. Prevention is incredible. And we're really, really good at preventing breaches. But guess what? Nobody's perfect. Okay, and the reasons nobody's perfect, there, there's a multitude of them, but nobody's perfect. So we'll get into what we can do with those two situations. So almost all security products are point in time solutions, right? If it sits on the network and it is supposed to be allowing something in or out of the network, it gets one chance, right? So it gets one chance to say that file is good, this file is bad, these three are good, that one's bad. So it looks at it one time and it makes a determination. Well, guess what? File dispositions change over time. And the concept of, uh, of uh, indications of compromise would mean three different things. More, three or more different things would have to change, and, and one of those could be a file. 
So I've seen a file, um, it, I've seen a file before that is a Word document, and all it is is a list of known process names. That's not necessarily nefarious, right? Unless the Trojan reads from those process names and then tries to kill all those processes because it's Norton.exe and it's McAfee and it's all these other security products that are out there. So if I see this file and I see this sort of outbound communication to this known IP range, then guess what? Now I can start making some much more intelligent decisions rather than just the name of the file, where it was, was it quarantined? What if I could tell you where it came from? How it got onto the system? Who else has that file? What it did whenever it did execute? Did it try to create a directory key? Did it create a subdirectory? Did it spawn three more processes? Did it start doing outbound communication to known bad IP ranges? That'd be a lot more interesting than just this. Again, this is a point in time. This is really important. We're not here to replace antivirus. Antivirus is an important component. This is what it can give you, though. So, what Cisco is doing. So that's kind of the state of the industry. So what Cisco is doing. So about three years ago, um, I didn't work for Cisco at the time, and I was a Cisco security is an oxymoron type guy myself. Um, ABC, anything but Cisco. Um, so what did Cisco do three years ago, though? They bought Sourcefire. And with that acquisition, along came Marty Resch. Marty Resch, you know, people should bow down. The guy is really, really intelligent, right? He started Snort. Um, he created Sourcefire. What they did differently with, this, with that acquisition is they kept Marty, and Marty is now uh, the chief technology architect around security solutions. So they acquired him, and they gave him $3 billion and said, go buy more things that make all of this work well together and start solving some real problems. And that's exactly what he did. So these were the questions that customers told us we needed to be able to answer. I promise you they're coming. If, if we wanted to be serious about this, about malware, we decided three years ago that that was the, that was the biggest challenge that we saw on, on, you know, out there and that nobody had a great answer for. So again, these are the types of questions that we had to be able to answer. So what did, oh, I like these. Your team identifies a malware infection. Your board wants a damage assessment. Can you report how long the malware went unnoticed, point of entry, affected systems, or known containment status. Can you do that? Yes, no, or I would just quit before the re having to report to the board. Aha, there we go. This is a person with the resume together. Aha. So it's just an interesting exercise, isn't it, to kind of think about this sort of stuff, right? If you got the FBI call and people started asking you the hard questions, how do you find out this information? All right, so one of the things we did, we acquired a guide with a beard, apparently. I don't make these slides. Um, we acquired Source Fire and Threat Grid, which is primarily the fo products I focus on in OpenDNS. Neohapsis was a consulting arm, and Cognitive is a threat analytics engine. All right, so all these components start to work together, and you start having some really, really great answers around things, for example, ransomware. The combination of what we call Sourcefire now, we call it AMP, Advanced Malware Protection, the combination of AMP and OpenDNS will knock down 99% of, of ransomware uh, situations that exist today. We created this organization called the GSSO. It's about 5,000 people. I'm part of that. So we're a really, really big security company inside the world's largest networking company. All right, so where do we stand as far as security effectiveness? This is the breach detection system by NSS Labs. They did it in 2014. They did it in 2015. Um, and this is where we scored on 2015. We actually were in the 98s on 2014, jumped up to 99.2 in 2015. And we're the only vendor to block 100% of the evasion techniques, which were pretty simple. They packed the file using a custom packer. They compressed the file. They sent it in three, fi in three different files. Uh, those weren't, uh, I like this number as much as I like that one. Um, this goes back to the, you can't block everything, okay? Prevention is a panacea. You can prevent as much as you can, but you have to have a solution and an answer for what gets through. So 99.2%, let's say you're an organization that gets, even a small organization, uh, if you get 1,000 targeted attacks a day, is 0.8% of that, 1% of that okay? <laughs> Probably not. So what do you do whenever it gets through? So security effectiveness. This is a statistic around us making our own stuff better, for example. So the white bar, this is an actual customer's data. The white bar is what we were blocking from our email security appliance, ESA. 
um, the old iron port stuff, right? So that's how much we were blocking. And we were really effective. And ESA has five different detection engines before it ever gets to AMP, all right? AMP is the red bar. AMP is the advanced malware piece. That's what I focus on. So it has five different detection, a, a, everything from, there's two different, fla there's Sophos and McAfee AV in there. There is um, uh, cinder base reputation filtering. Um, uh, there is uh, bounce backs. There, there's five different detection engines in there, and it caught a lot of stuff, right? And that's incredible. I've seen, you know, customers getting 2.5 emails a day, you know, and how much is getting through and what have you. And so the red bars, what we added was the additive effect. So basically, we improved it by about 50%, but the bigger number is 31% of this malware had never been seen before, all right? So they had signature-based solutions. This malware had never been seen before. We were still able to stop it. And I'll show you exactly how that works. All right, so this is a wordy slide with big numbers and what have you. Anybody familiar with VirusTotal? VirusTotal website, you go to, you upload a hash or you upload a file, and you tell it, and it'll tell you out of 55 security vendors, who knows about it, right? Sometimes I see 10 to 12, a lot of times we see zero. 57% of 5 million files we convicted in January, it had never seen before. We thought that was anomalous because normally we'd seen between 30 and 40. We're like, whoa, 57. Let's put it on a slide. It makes us sound good. The next month was 61 and last month was 64. So it's getting worse. It's not getting better because it's more and more targeted malware. All right? So if it's never been seen before, nobody can stop it with a signature. All right. So that time to detect. I said it was 200 hours. I've seen studies everywhere from 125 to 250 something. So I always pick 200. Cisco... Obviously, we think of ourselves as a security company and even did back in December 2014. Started Operation Dog Food to roll AMP out internally. AMP is an architecture. It's a group of products that work better together but have no dependencies on one or the other. And you don't have to own anything from Cisco to, to, to have this. All right? Um, so um, to start using this, I'm sorry. So we started off at about 50 hours. We were pretty proud of that number. Well, over the time that we started deploying the product, we're down to 17.5 hours. Imagine the size of the Cisco network, right? So there's <laughs> lots and lots and lots of machines and files and what have you. So in about 17.5 hours from the time a file starts acting badly, we can contain that, okay? All right, so anytime you talk to Cisco these days, you're gonna see BDA, before, during, and after. Before is, is hardening systems. This gets into blocking. During, what can you do? What can you report on? What can you show that's happening? And then after, how can you contain it and how can you remediate it across an entire infrastructure? So this is one of the quote unquote secret sauce pieces. So Sourcefire had a vulnerability research team. Cisco had, an, had a research team. Together, they're now called Talos. Um, Talos sees, uh, uh, we at Cisco see about one third of the world's email traffic. We also see, with the OpenDNS acquisition, about 90 billion DNS requests a day. So we see unprecedented amounts of data. This organization is about 600 engineers, okay? Everything from threat researchers, reverse engineering guys, um, communications folks to be able to work uh, by, uh, with everything from competitors to law enforcement. So this organization has, is capturing tons and tons and tons of data and guess what? About every three to five minutes, we're updating the AMP, what we call the AMP cloud. So all the AMP products that are out there. So something hits, something nasty hits Europe in the morning, before, by the time you get in, you're protected, okay? These are as near real time as we can get. These are about, and these are tiny. These are, uh, I saw a thing today, uh, 100, no, I'm sorry, 390 bytes about 35 times a day, okay? So it's not a bandwidth hog, it's not a CPU challenge. Um, because of the way we're doing it, and I'll show you that a bit in a second. So, in addition to threat intelligence, we, we have two different types of engines, point-in-time protection and retrospective. Retrospective is the unique piece. Point-in-time protection, yeah, we do it differently, and I'll show you how that works, too, because that can mean a multitude of things. So, point-in-time protection, everything from one-on-one -on -one signatures, which these aren't, don't think AV signatures, think SHA-256 hashes, all right? So, have we ever seen this file before? Remember I said point in time solution either has to say good or bad and then never looks at things again. The difference with AMP is we say good, bad, or unknown. If we say unknown, we continue to look at that, all right? We also look at it every time it moves, copies, executes. 
So one-to-one -one signatures, and these are our signatures. We're not pulling these from third parties. We're not dependent upon anybody else. Fuzzy fingerprinting, this is really helpful in ransomware because there's really only six major families and about 25 variants. But guess what did I say? <laughs> there's not very many good uh, malware writers, so all they do is buy and copy, right? So guess what? Uh, yeah, I changed three things, but it's 99% the same, right? So that's how we're catching things like that. Machine learning, throw known good and known bad. If all you do is throw known bad, how does it know what's good? Indication of compromise, I talked about that. If it uh, changes the registry key to survive a reboot at the same time uh, that it changes the master boot record and uh, creates a, a registry key in a weird place and starts running executables out of the, out of the uh, recycle bin, probably not good. Probably not a good day for somebody who's working late. Um, we get into dynamic analysis, the, abil the ability to uh, execute malware, right? Blow it up. Watch it with a camera and show you exactly what it does. It's pretty crazy to see a, a Word document, somebody double clicks and it opens as a PDF, right? Because I can change that label. You know, I can call it dot, dot .doc. So interesting things like that. And then we don't, we're not going to explain all of these. Um, so there's seven different. But then we're going we're gonna to do this continuously. We're going to be everywhere. We're going to be all the time. So this is how this works, all right? So I'm going to talk specifically about AMP for endpoints. All right, so you've got Talos up there. This is the user interface. If you have other, the Firepower Management Console, so if you have our firewalls, if you have our IPS, if you have any of those sorts of things, this is going to feed right into it. So, or again, a file is written, copied, moved, or executed for the first time. First time. We analyze it. We say, hey, Cloud, is this good or bad? If it is, if it is not known to be malicious, it is admitted, all right? So you may still end up with a patient zero situation, right? We haven't said it's good, we said it's not bad, right? We don't know that it's bad. It may be good or it may be unknown. The second scenario, we have a known bad file. It goes up, Talos says, oh no, this is bad. So we will not allow it into the system, okay? So that's how those two work. I am stepping all over myself. Um, we'll jump past this one. Even though it has fancy ones and zeros going across there. All right, so what is retrospective security? This is part of the secret sauce. This is the big differentiator. Um, let me build this out here, sorry. All right, so this is the way the world works. Antivirus, sandboxing, firewalls, it doesn't matter. It's gonna make a point in time decision about a file. Point in time analysis stops if, and these are easily known bypasses, all right? Um, and then it's going to be infected within your system if it bypasses this, and then it's never going to be looked at again. This device doesn't have the ability to go back over here and look at that. just doesn't have that concept. So things like sleep techniques. Sleep techniques is a pretty interesting one. Think about knocking over a convenience store. You walk in the first one, there's five cameras. Like, this probably isn't exactly a target-rich environment for me. I'm going to go to Quickie Mart next door. Quickie Mart doesn't have any, so now you've found your target. That's the way sleep techniques work. The way every sandbox that's out there works, except for ours, um, is they either use hooks or debuggers. And so decent malware, and I can show you this, decent malware, the first thing it does, it says, is there a hook present? And that's just a simple system call, Win32 system call. And it says, uh, are there hooks present, right? If neither of those things, then it may start doing nasty things if it can't see either of those things. If it's easy either of those, the way I would do it is say sleep for 12 hours because I'm not in any hurry. I know I've written some good code here. I'm not in any hurry, and I know you have to pass that file through because it's PDF and it's an email to the CFO or the CFO's admin or the executive's admin because I know he doesn't read his email anyway. All right? So sleep techniques, that's exactly how you bypass the sandbox. That's the easiest way. Uh, that's one of the easier ways. Encryption's going to bypass all every network component unless you're doing SSL decryption with somebody like Redware. A polymorphism. Uh, the Drydex variant uh, that's out right now, it's polymorphic. Every time it lands somewhere, creates a different, it creates a different SHA-256, all right? So you, if you've seen it once, you've never seen it once, right? And so if you change that, it's always going to pass through. So again, back to AMP, Advanced Malware Protection from Cisco. First time we see a file, we may allow it through too, all right? You may still have patient zero. You may still have to pave and replace this, this machine. But what we're going to do is we are going to do retrospective detection where we keep an eye on that file. 
we then grab some metadata from that and throw it up to that Talos cloud and say, here's more information about that file we just let through. Has anybody else ever seen it? Are there any, you know, is this, you know, does this fit anything? Let's run it through, uh, let's, let's explode it and see what happens. Let's start to take some more advanced testing techniques. If and then we find something two days, two hours, two weeks later, we then come back and tell you, hey, we let through that file. Here's everywhere it exists in your, in your environment. Right click if you want to, it's, you don't have to. Right click if you want to and say never allow that file to run again in my system, right? And at the same time, since you were patient zero, I'm sorry, pay, <laughs> the guy who, who works next door to you, that has uh, the, the company next door to you, well, they're protected because we've, already, because we've now said that's known bad, right? So that goes onto our known bad list. It wasn't on our known bad list when we first saw it, okay? That happens. So that's where you get into prevent, prevent, prevent until you can't. All right, so AMP. This is just gonna kinda answer a few more questions here real quickly. So we can tell you the who, so we can tell you what users have, uh, are infected in a breach, um, which applications are affected, we're watching everything that happens. We're not just watching for malware. So we can start to answer, so, sorry, I'm a, I've jumped ahead. So we can start to answer some interesting questions here, like every version of Java that's out there, why do we have 15 versions? Why do I have seven versions of Adobe Acrobat Reader, right? These three haven't been updated in two years. We can start to show you some of that. That's gonna show you which applications are introducing the most malware. This one's gonna show where this is what we call a heat map in the product. It's going to show you which areas within your organization, this is custom for you guys, everybody would build it out differently, either sites or business units or people or floors or our desktop servers, however you wanted to. This is going to show you exactly where the, the infection is or the breach is. This is going to show you everything that's done over time. So think of a black box recorder or a DVR. We're going to be able to record and go back through time and show you everything that it has touched over time, and then we can even get you all the way back to patient zero, okay? So the product has the ability to block proactively. I talked about that, or, and, and that's what we call protect mode. There's also uh, not really a learning, don't think of it as learning, but it's called audit mode, where we're not blocking anything. That's why these sorts of things happen, and it's much better for a demo if we allow nasty things to happen, because then we can show you. For example, uh, the, the example I used earlier, um, Joe from accounting, because we're integrated back in, we can tell you exactly what user. Joe from accounting visited this website using Chrome. Um, it downloaded this nasty Java file, which then wrote these three, direct, these three files. And see all these red points? Those are points that we could have stopped, right? So we could have stopped the first instant. But then it started doing this. And then this is part of that subtree. It started doing nasty things. So all the red stuff is bad. But again, we can show you the origin and the progression of the threat. And it's not about finger pointing or firing bill in accounting. It's, it's about understanding where the threat came from, right? And then being proactive in that ability to block it in the future. So, oh, this one didn't render real well. So AMP everywhere is kind of an architecture, if you will. So AMP can be deployed. These are all Cisco devices, as you can imagine. ASA firewalls, next generation IPS, a, a custom built, box, a custom -built uh, device to run AMP for networks. Uh, on the web and email security, and also uh, in the cloud, if you're using cloud web security pieces. So that's gonna provide you network or umbrella level protection for things coming into and out of the network. For endpoints, we can run on Windows, back to Windows 7 or Server 2003, Android, VMware Citrix, Mac 10 and 11, CentOS and, and Red Hat. So uh, AMP, for, AMP for endpoints is also gonna give you off network protection, Okay, so it doesn't have any dependency. There is no, again, the intelligence is in the cloud. The a, these, these are gonna have agents though, okay? Tiny little guys, I can show you exactly what that looks like. And again, they're getting their updates from the cloud if they're on, net, if they're on the network or not. Um, what you're gonna have is different perspectives, right? So what a firewall sees versus what an endpoint sees are two different things. But if we can correlate what the firewall saw with what the endpoint started to do, then we start getting some really interesting answers to questions. And we get into the ability to remediate if we are running at the endpoint, right? That right click and say, never allow this to run again, okay? Application whitelisting, blacklisting, all kinds of fun stuff we can do at the endpoint. Um, okay. AMP is better together, yippee. Whoa. Promise I'll be done by five. All right, so remember those questions? Remember I told you we could answer them? Ta-da! 
All right, so what is Threat Grid? Threat Grid is the last piece I want to talk about. Threat Grid is another acquisition we made about a year and a half ago, and Threat Grid is a malware analysis and threat intelligence solution. Okay, comes with 11 different threat feeds out of the box. They can be sticks, taxi, what have you, so they can feed into your SIM, so you can run vulnerability scans against them. You can do a ton of different data. Yes. Um, we also have the ability to, we, you would have the ability, the products have the ability to, um, that would be the analyst, you, or an automated submission into effectively a sandbox, if you will, okay? Submit your files if it, if, and say, is this good, good, bad, or indifferent, okay? The system is automatically going to submit files that it doesn't know about, all right? One of the interesting things that you can see from AMP, though, is least prevalence. All right, so I've got, within my system, I've gotten, you know, a, a thousand copies of something called word.exe, but only one over here called, you know, Gerald's Nasty Trojan.exe. I wonder what that might be, right? So we can help you start to uh, identify where the least prevalent files are, and then let's automatically submit those to ThreatGrid because we don't know what those are, okay? Um, it's going to correlate samples, do 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 um, Over 500 different be behavioral indicators, right? These are going to be things, and we're going to give everything a severity and confidence score. All right, so if uh, for this, this one actually had a signature. That's why it's 100. Only if we know the name of the actual uh, uh, threat would we give it 100. Everything else, the highest we would ever give it is a 95, but a 95 means we know everything about it, but it's never been named in the wild before. Okay, so when a process modifies an executable file, generally not a great idea. Um, this one is that survive reboot piece I was talking about earlier. Okay, maintain a persistence on the host after a reboot. A document file, establish a network communication. Not generally a good idea either. So we take these things, we start to add, everything above 70 probably needs to be looked at, right? Um, so th this one is, is terrible. <laughs> so, we, so what you have the ability to do though, and, and it, you only submitted one file, right? Because we saw it on, on Joe User's system. What we also have the ability to do though from here is right click and you can, you can pivot on this sort of data. You can say show me everywhere this registry keys exist within my systems, okay? We only saw this one file on Joe user system, but all these other guys have this exact same registry key setting. Ta-da, now you're starting to be proactive, right? I told you if all I gave you was a bunch of data, I just increased your workload. This is gonna be able to automatedly enable you to find where those systems are and then remediate them. All right, so we've talked about this. Whew, I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Automatically submit suspicious files. We talked about that. Ta-da. Man, when I was hiding files earlier, I must have been in a really talkative mood. Showed you this one already. Die. Um, so, again, this is built around an API, right? Again, no, I, I have a customer today that owns zero Cisco except for this. Um, and they integrated in with Tripwire, okay? So these are out-of-the-box integrations if you're using Encase uh, for, for hardware, if you're using Tripwire. RSA Security Analytics uses this on the back end, headless, okay, because it's driven off an API. Or you can submit things to it. All the Cisco products are going to submit to it. All of these guys have the ability to automatedly submit to it, or you can submit your own files to it. All right, so Anchor Point and Cisco, better together. 